Hello, can everyone hear me in the back? Yes. So uh, I am delighted to be here uh, to wrap up our sessions. Uh, I want to almost preface by saying somewhat what Jennifer said earlier. I'm really here to reflect on the discussion as a theater maker, because while I do teach uh, the practice of theater, I am primarily a theater maker, a director of shows, operas, musicals, and I'm going to try to impart uh, some ideas to you based on my vantage point from making theater. So the first thing I'm going to do is say, if I walked into this auditorium, and often theater happens in rooms like this, and the audience looked like this, it would be a problem. And I would deploy all my ushers to condense this audience so we become a community. So I'm going to annoy you right now and ask everyone to move. If we could bring everybody down, the last 10 rows are now unofficially closed, officially closed. And please come down and let's fill the center section. So we don't want to have any empty seats here. So, so already I hope you, you can observe it maybe feels different. <laughs> It might be harder for you to go on your cell phone and multitask and answer emails now that you have people right next to you. Um, and I just want to also ask if we could raise the lights on the auditorium to full. Okay. So these are conditions that we as directors constantly think about. Uh, how is our audience configured? What is the environment you want to create? And I would just encourage you to take control of those and not assume that an environment you enter has to be a given. You can actually direct your students to become more of a community right off the bat. Um, originally, I was asked to synthesize the day and address the questions and see if we could answer them. And that already made me incredibly nervous. And then by lunchtime, when I looked at the questions, I came to Bob and the HILT organizer. I said, forget it. There's no way we're going to answer those in an interactive discussion with 400 people. Um, and, and what I want to impart about that, actually, what I've learned today is the idea of patience that I think was so uh, beautifully articulated earlier, and this idea of living in questions. And what I do as a director mentoring young directors who want to make theater is they always come to me and say, well, what are the answers? I don't have a concept. I don't have a vision. I'm not sure what I'm doing. And I always turn around and say, what is the question you are asking in the production you want to direct, in your project? And if anything, as a pedagogue, I try to encourage a student, a young director, to ask a, bitter, uh, ask a bigger question. And I think what Francis said earlier about this notion of have we put ourselves to the test of an innovation that we are really, wor that we are worthy of, made me think of this idea of asking the biggest questions we can. Uh, as a director, what I feel the job is, and I'm going to let you make the analogies to your life as a student or a faculty or a staff, the job of a director is to sense a potential. And our job is to sense a potential and to admit, actually, that we don't know how to get there. And if the potential for an image of a, a metaphor is at the top of a mountain, my job as the director is to encourage everybody to climb the mountain. And that's my cast of actors, my playwright who has to do rewrites, my conductor who has to motivate the orchestra. We've got to get to that sense of potential, but I don't know how to get there. And actually, my job is when we're halfway up the mountain and everybody's tired and scared and wants to go back down, I have to keep everybody going up the mountain. But this idea that uh, I think we've heard often today, that we don't have to know the answers, that we can be vulnerable, and certainly in the theater, and it's why I became a theater person, is because I thrive and live on collaboration. I actually believe I can't think without people in the room. And that's why I love to be a director, because I start every process, every rehearsal process, whether it's for an opera or for Pippin, which is now on Broadway, the very first thing I say in the first day of rehearsal is, I will have ideas, you will have ideas, and I'm usually talking to a cast of actors, and I'll say together, we will have a third idea that is better than either of ideas, and that's where we want to go. And automatically, that puts the actor not in the position of, where do you want me to go? That's like the nightmare. You're, you talk about the cold call. 
an actor looks at a director and says, what do you want me to do? I want to get that attitude out of the room, out of the rehearsal. I want actually the actor to feel like they're a creative collaborator, that they're, they're a participant, that they're thinking of the big picture as well as inside their role, and that through collaboration we're actually going to problem solve. Uh, I'm just curious, I can't not take this moment to ask how many people here know the ART? Is that familiar? That's so good, that makes me very happy. <laughs> good, I don't have to describe it, but I do want to say one thing about our mission, because I think it might pertain to the conversation today. The American Repertory Theater is a professional theater here on campus. Uh, our mission, that's our not-for-profit mission, is to expand the boundaries of theater through classical work of the past and the future voices of tomorrow. And it's why I took this job five years ago, because I thought that was a pretty enlightened mission. Because what it means is everything we do at that theater is about questioning what is theater. And what that means for me really is that we never rest on an, ex an assumption about what the theater is. Now, typically you talk to someone and you say, what do you think theater is? Like, close your eyes and imagine, what do you think theater is? What comes up for you? Most people will say, I walk in an auditorium, I walk in a theater, the seats are bolted to the floor, I come with friends, but then the lights go down, I get a program, I'm not supposed to talk, even though I've been very social, all of a sudden I'm sitting like this, facing the audience. If I get too disruptive, I might be asked to leave, so we don't behave that way in the theater. And I watch a show and I'm either deeply moved or maybe I fall asleep, and at the end, I leave. And I don't, that's my theatrical experience. And it's amazing how much that description of an experience of theater is really what people then start to emulate or start to assume are the defining parameters of theater. And for me, it's not about innovating to anything really new. It's actually about looking backwards to theater history. Theater was really never like that in its origins and ritual when you think about theater and town squares and pageant plays and all kinds of uh, festivals in ancient Greek Athens. Theater has so much more of a, of, a, of a defining parameter than what we assume today. So what I've been doing at the ART is saying, what is theater? How do we produce it? What does it look like? Is it a play in a theater? Is it outdoors? Is it street theater? Is it in an abandoned school, which was our production of Sleep More, No More several years ago, a, a theatrical installation in an abandoned school where the audience walks with a mask on their face? Does it happen at 8 o'clock or can it happen at midnight? And we've been trying to diversify our experience. So we have a headquarters at the Loeb Drama Center, which is a big theater like this, 600 seats. But we also now have a small club theater. And we try to take theater out on the street. And we try to make theater in outdoor locations and try to actually adapt the form to whatever environment we're in and not be uh, slavishly following rules of what the theater experience has to be. So that has resonated for me today as we've gone through these discussions. Um, I want to look at the word cloud that you saw earlier, so if we could put that up. Because um, we just looked at it really quickly, first thing this morning. Um, when I saw this, what, what, what interested me is one of the biggest words um, was listening, but really the biggest word there was engagement. And I actually think there's a connection between the two of how we listen is related to how engaged we are. And I also just wanted to share some observations about engagement from the vantage point of creating theater. In my field, the discussion has professionally shifted in the last five years from art to engagement. Literally, we do not talk anymore about the art on the stage. It has seismically shifted to talking about engagement. And for me, what talking in, about engagement means is including the audience. So we're not as concerned just about the artistic event, just about the artist's voice, just about the process that develops the best product on the stage, but are we connecting with an audience? Are we engaging an audience? How are we casting the audience as our partner in the theatrical event. So for me, that is a huge uh, correlation to what we're talking about here in education. Uh, what I want you to think about are just some things
things from the theater point of view. What I mean by engagement and the audience is you might have a play, a text that you're given, and the play has a message, the playwright has an idea. But it's not just about that, it's actually as a director, or you could say teacher, I'm thinking about what do I want the audience to feel? What do I want the audience to take away? What do, how do I want to present this play, this text, this idea, in a way that will have a particular impact or effect on an audience? And in my field, the generation has shifted. I think there was a time where nobody wanted to think about audience, and if you were an <coughs> artist that thought about audience, you were pandering. But this idea that you can actually think about your audience, and the idea of your audience can actually inspire you, and that's been my experience as a director, that when I think about an audience, why should they come to the theater? I mean, of course, here at Harvard, we think, of course, students should come to our classes. But for me at the theater, it's a very big question. Why should I even expect anyone in this time where they're so busy and there's so many deaths, why should they pay down money and come into a live theater? That's a very generous act, and I have to really understand why they would do that. So this idea of thinking about an audience and therefore then programming what I program at the theater based on what I think it will catalyze for an audience. People often ask me, how do you pick the shows you pick at the ART? My big answer is actually not so much, oh, I have a roster of artists that I love to support. It's more, what do I want to catalyze? What kind of conversation do I want to catalyze? What kind of dialogue do I want to catalyze? What do I want the audience to be provoked to think about? Again, not dictated to, but what do I want that audience to wrestle with and leave the theater uh, disturbed by? So much so that they'll chat about it on their way out, that they'll get online and discuss it, or they'll uh, pursue conversation. Uh, there was a play in London by Carol Churchill on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and it was 20 minutes long. And you can imagine already a 20-minute play, you'd probably be very attentive knowing that it's only 20 minutes long. But what happened after this play is that nobody left, and people stayed in their seats, and they talked about it for the following hour. And to me, that was as much the play, even though as artists, as the professionals, we put all our effort I mean, a year, two years, three years, nine years on the development of artistic product, on that 20 minutes or that two hours, actually the event is much larger. And that event, which I call act two of discussion, is as important and something that we should curate and think about that larger definition of the theatrical experience. Um, in order to do this, I would argue we have to actually think about activating the audience. And I don't mean to repeat Jonathan Walton and his uh, peanut ad, the, the little snippet of, was that uh, Schroeder who was snoring in the class? But um, how many people have gone to the theater and seen people sleeping or have slept at the theater? Just curious, raise your hand. Yes. That's horrible. That's just horrible. And you know what? I'm not going to blame you. I'm going to blame us, the theater makers. For me, that we could allow an audience to fall asleep at a live theater show, to me is the equivalent of like a, we're, we're doing an operation and a patient's dying and we let the patient die. B because for me, all the innovation in technology, you can think about TV, film, all these things that have happened in the 20th century that could maybe make my art form obsolete, have actually said, to us, the theater makers, what is so unique about your form? What is so necessary about the live event that you can't get on a video, that you can't get when you watch a film in your house or even a movie theater? What is it about the live event? And if you're falling asleep at a live event, then the audience doesn't matter. And I think too often in the theater, you go to the theater, the event is rolling along, and it has that feeling of being canned. That if you were sitting here, or not, it would make no difference on the live event. And the most thrilling live events are when the audience feels like they have an effect. And uh, I want to give you one recent example from uh, our production of Pippin. So Charlotte Demboise is a, a, a wonderful dancer. She's the one of the leading principals in the show on Broadway. She does these really fast costume changes, very tricky, very technical. This was in our preview period a few weeks ago. She does the big costume change. She flicks her head, and her entire wig goes flying 10 feet across the stage. You know, 
1,200 people watching her, that's mortifying. Talk about feeling vulnerable in a moment on stage. The, 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 that, so then she had, and she had the wig cap on. I mean, it wasn't even pretty under there. It was like that. A wig cap is like a piece of a stocking that holds your hair down. It really doesn't look nice. And we were all, all the creative team were in the back like, oh my God, oh my God, how is she going to get out of this? So what she does is she rips off the wig cap. Now, inside the wig cap is the mic pack to her mic. So then I said, oh my God, she's taking the mic off. So she throws the mic into the wing. So now she's on a Broadway stage, which you all know are heavily mic'd. There's no such thing as using your own voice anymore, right? You're, even today you heard when someone was mic'd and then not mic'd. It's terrible. You feel like they're weak and you can't feel them. So there she is without the microphone, without her hair, and she dances the end of the number, and by the end, the audience is cheering for her so loudly. She has one line she has to give, and they don't let her speak. And she goes to speak, and they keep applauding, and she goes to be, and they keep applauding, and she acknowledges the presence. And I swear, she had that audience more in support of her than any other audience I think I saw for the hundred shows I watched because of this accident. And then what had to happen is they finally calmed down. She kind of went like this. And she had to speak to 1,200 people. And she had to use her voice. And she said this line. And she had to kind of like really scream it to reach to the balcony. And that even drove them more wild because they could <laughs> see that it was like her naked voice reaching to that audience. So I just give you that example as encouragement for any of those uh, vulnerable moments. They can become opportunities, I think, as someone said. Next exercise. Uh, one of the core tenets of the theater is storytelling. And I think we've heard a lot today about anecdotes and narrative. Um, and I wanted to see if we have, I think we have some students here. Um, but for, for the next minute, I, I actually ask, I'd like to ask all of you to take the next moment in silence to think about an anecdote, a moment when either as a student or a teacher, you felt that you were particularly engaged. Uh, so in other words, a moment where you were um, a transformative experience in the classroom, either from a teaching point of view or from a learning point of view. So, don't write it down. You're not going to have to write it down. Just everybody search your memory bank and see if you could zero in on an anecdote you could tell about one moment of your experience where you felt a transformative experience, personal experience, either as a student or a teacher. So just take the next minute to think about that. Good. Does everybody have one? A kernel of one? Okay. Before we go to our, our high participation event here, I just want to ask um, if there is a student in the audience who might be able to share that anecdote with us today. Oh, great. Excellent. Can, can we get the mic so we can fully hear this, even though I'm an advocate of using your own voice, unmediated. But, and tell us your name and your class and what you're studying, if you wouldn't mind. Hello. Woo. <laughs> My name is Tiffany, and I'm a sophomore studying government at the college and also social anthropology. Um, so this semester I took a class on Tokyo and it was essentially an anthropology course kind of disguised as a general education course. And you, <laughs> and you could tell the professor was in love with the material just by the way um, he was so animated in class and was so engaged and just had all these side stories that kind of, you know, didn't always follow what was on the PowerPoint. So I thought that was great. So during one of his office hours, I went in to discuss my final project. And it dealt with Tokyo as well as capoeira, which is a Brazilian martial art. And they're two very different things, but I you know, found a way to combine them. And so I was explaining it to him, and he was so interested on how I'd been able to make this connection and bring capoeira into anthropology. Um, and just the way he lit up when I started talking about it and making these connections was really empowering to me. And afterwards, he actually ended up doing a bit of research on it himself and then got back to me and um, shared his findings with me. And that was really encouraging just to kind of give agency to students and knowing that learning can be a two-way street and that even though you are learning, you still have the power to teach someone else something in the midst of your learning, so. Fantastic, thank you. I, I think we heard that uh, discussed many times today about 
teaching not putting us in the position of feeling like we are the experts. So, might there be another student here who would be willing to volunteer? Oh, fantastic, one more there. Hi, um, my name's Anna. Um, I'm a senior at the college, also studying government um, with a secondary in economics. And I've been thinking a lot about um, a class that I took my sophomore fall. Actually, it was called um, Education, Race, and Gender. It was in the WGS department. And you know, it had been after my freshman year, which was very new and a lot harder than I expected. Um, and it was a really transformative class for me because of the fascinating theories that we engaged with and kind of the framework that it gave me to think about um, education at Harvard and, and what my strengths were that I could bring to my education here. And one particular moment that I was thinking about was um, a day towards the end of the semester when um, in lecture she kind of opened it up to anyone to share their experiences and to engage with the material like from their own personal perspectives. And hearing everyone, all these students, I mean so often at Harvard we kind of have a front up or something like that, but people just speaking so genuinely and openly about their experiences. Um, what was the and, topic? So their, their identities um, in terms of race and gender and how that in, impacted their learning and their experience as students. And the way the teacher was really like listening to each of us and um, I just felt like part of a community and it made it very personal. So um, that was a great moment for me. So you remembered even though that was in the distant sophomore year yeah. for you, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that also resonated from today. Yeah. Um, how we can empower our audience, our students, to uh, make a connection and be part of the creative act. Uh, so what I'd like you to do now, we've done a lot of talking to our neighbors, but hopefully you're sitting next to someone new now. Uh, you're going to find a partner. Um, and turn to that partner and decide which of you is A and which is you is B. So let's see if we can find enough twos. If you find yourself a third person out, just join in and become a trio and become C. So go ahead, see if you can make a group. Think, has everybody found a group? Yes? Okay, so you're going to take, um, what you're going to do is you're going to take the next 30 seconds to a minute and the person who is an A is going to tell B that anecdote that I made you come up with, right? So you're going to now share that anecdote. The A's go first, okay? Try to keep it to a minute and go ahead. Thank you. Now, now if you haven't switched over, maybe some of you did that organically, but now the B's should tell their story. So if you, if you, maybe you went on to that process on your own, but if you haven't, now B's tell your story. Go ahead. Okay, okay, good, good, good. And now, because I see there are a number of trios out there, if you're in a trio, this should be the opportunity for the C's to tell their story. And if you're in a duo, you have an extra minute to elaborate or ask questions. And go. Yeah, you can talk. If, you can ask each other questions about your story. Good, good, good. I'm just going to now move on. Thank you, everybody. What I'd like you to do now is to take your index card and flip it over, and you are going to write the answer to the next prompt, which comes up here. What that story, and if you're in a trio, you just have to pick one of them, or you could globalize across the two stories. What that story makes me realize about teaching and learning is blank. See if you can maybe make a conclusion for yourself right now about what you've just heard. So take a minute to write and complete that sentence. Great, so what I'm going to ask you to do, because we just have a minute and a half left, I want to say a concluding comment, but your assignment after this session ends, we're going to adjourn outside to the science fair and more refreshments and all that. You're going to take this card outside and you have an assignment. In the process of the next 20 minutes when you're out there, or five minutes, you can accomplish it very quickly, you're going to introduce yourself to someone you've never met before at Harvard and you are going to give them this card as a gift to take away for the day. So that is your assignment. Um, what I just want to say, two thoughts. One is um, for you to think about that perhaps the most <coughs> powerful moment of a performance can be when the audience feels they've had a voice. For Charlotte D'Amboise on that Broadway stage, 
the most powerful moment was when the audience said, we're here, and we see you half naked with your hair and wig gone, and we still love you. That was the most powerful moment. And the last thought is, I think, um, what's extraordinary to me about Hilt is this opportunity to experiment, that we've been given the space and some resource to really ask questions and live in a laboratory of experimentation with teaching and learning. And I hope we all can use each other as a community to really uh, exercise that uh, task. So thank you very much, and back to Bob.